okay, Christ is the one that gave him. You can actually, you have to go all the way back up to verse 7 to see where his name is, is initially used in that statement. What are the equippers teaching? And you may have to go after verse 12 to see that one. Okay, faith and knowledge of what? Of the Son of God. All right, we might even, within the context of the passage, we could actually go all the way back to, to verses 4 through 6, which are some very core doctrines of the church, okay? You and I, we need to be equipped. We need to know what these doctrines are. Um, the body, what's the body? The spirit, hope, our calling, Lord, faith, baptism, God and Father, okay? These are all things we need to know about. So they're teaching doctrines is what they're teaching. Uh, why are they teaching it according to our context? Okay, so that they won't be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind, and, and it's of false doctrine actually, what, uh, what else? Why else? Okay, unity of the faith in the knowledge of Christ. What else? Okay, building up the body of Christ. Uh, okay, that speaking the truth and love comes later in that passage. Yep. Okay, so we can grow in our relationship. Anything else? Okay, maturity, yep, yep. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And of course, as Amanda said, that we won't, if we, if, we, if we do grow, if we do mature, if we do know the truth and we're able to speak the truth, articulate the truth, um, then we won't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, okay? Rather, we'll, we'll grow spiritually and, and numerically. So what we're going to look at over the course of the, the, the mo almost eight months are both core teachings of the Bible, like what we find in verses 4 through 6, along with those um, core teachings, we're going to look at, like I said, a, a number of very important teachings, many of which have been twisted by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, by which many, even in the church, okay, have been tossed to and fro and led astray. Um, in fact, one of the important teachings we're going to be looking at in two weeks, and I'd never actually, I'd never done a study on this doctrine before, so it was very exciting for me to do it, but in two weeks we're going to look at the doctrine of apostasy. How does that happen? How does that happen? Okay, so I'm, I, I hope you, you continue on here, all right? Um, verse 14 in this uh, passage, Ephesians 4, um, uses the word doctrine, talking about um, false doctrines, but uh, in our world, we, we hear a lot of talk today about indoctrination. So is the word doctrine a, a good word or a bad word? Okay, all right. I just want to, I just want to be clear because I, I, as I've been looking at the news a lot lately, the word indoctrination is certainly used in a negative. In fact, I can't remember the last time I heard the word doctrine or indoctrination used on the news in a positive sense. So I want, I want you to know that there are good doctrines and bad doctrines. There are true doctrines and false doctrines. All right? So it's, it's, a, it's a neutral word, though, that simply means teaching. That's what doctrine means, teaching. There are good ones, bad ones, true ones, false ones, but
but it means teaching. In fact, I'll show you how it's used. You don't have to turn there, but Jeremiah 10.8 says, but they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. So there's, there's a place in Scripture where it's used in a negative sense. In Matthew 16, 12, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Another use in a negative sense. Acts 2, 42, and they, the church, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And there it is in a positive sense, as well as 1 Timothy 4.16, where Paul tells Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And that, that passage right there is in relation to apostasy, which we're going to look at here in a couple weeks. But the pur purpose of the study is to equip us with, with true teachings so that we know not only what we believe, but what, why we believe it. Um, I will just mention this quickly um, because the... the as you know, words nowadays are changing meaning. Okay, there are a lot of words that, that are evolving into whole new meanings today, and doctrine is one of them. And, and this is probably why it is used more in a negative sense today than it is in a positive. Here, here's, here's the definition of doctrine from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. He says, doctrine is to teach, to instruct in rudiments and principles. That's it. That's it. But here is what, and I can't remember which website dictionary I looked at now, but here is how doctrine is often defined today. To teach a person or group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. There's a big difference in those two definitions. Huge difference. So as we talk about doctrine, know that we're looking at the, the original definition of this word, and it's simply a, a teaching of, of rudiments, okay? Principles, basics. Um, And we want to know, we want to know, I know, again, I feel like I'm sounding redundant, but we need to know the truth so we can identify the false when we hear it. And, and, I, and I think probably everyone here has a pretty good handle on the doctrine of salvation, and not only that you believe it, but I, I think that most everybody here probably has a, a good understanding of why they believe it, okay? But I want to play a, a video for you here real quick. You guys know who Steve Harvey is, okay, comedian? This is just a 30-second clip from him. He was asked about salvation. He, he professes to be a, a Christian. Here's what he said. Wait. That was, that was shorter than 30 seconds, I know. <laughs> See if I can find it. Way to heaven, no one way to paradise. It's like television. Now it's over 800 channels of cable, and they're all pretty entertaining. So I'm pretty sure, man, that to get to heaven, there's got to be more than one route. And because somebody watching another channel or taking another channel than you, they still getting entertained, and they probably still getting to heaven. So it's clear that this person... Way to right. heaven, no one way to paradise. That's good. Okay. Um, so, how would you refute him? Would you refute him? Jeff? 
Okay. And that this was actually a clip taken from some guy saying the exact same thing on, on the internet, calling him out. Uh, what, what he's proposing here is, is really a, a universalism. Um, and uh, it, it's that universalism is a very, very common teaching in our world today. If you have you seen the bumper sticker that says coexist? Okay, that's what he's talking about right there. And of course, did you, sure, right, right. Well, it, it and and really, he has to go there because everybody has a different God. So, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, John 14, 6, as Jeff said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Any other verses? What does Acts 4, 12 say? Okay, no other name. Jesus is the only name. Any other passages come to mind? All right. Yeah, there's the narrow is the way. That leads to, is it, I can't remember how he words that. I don't have it memorized and brought as the way it leads to destruction. And it, I, one of the, <laughs> it's interesting you bring that up because one of the other clips I thought about bringing up was of, uh, um, sadly, an interview that Robert Schuller, who would be a universalist, I think, an interview that he had with Billy Graham. And in the heat of the moment, uh, Billy Graham talked about there being a, um, basically that it's, it's up to God. And, and Schuler then said, yeah, it's, it's, it's a broad way. He actually used those words. But anyway, um, enough about that. Turn to 2 Peter, if you would. 2 Peter chapter 3. And this, this is another one of those passages that uh, kind of brought me to the reason for doing this. And again, it's another one of those passages that is dealing with uh, apostasy. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, uh, the Apostle Peter says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. And what, what is the warning of this verse? What's the warning that he's, that he's issuing here? What was that, Richard? Okay, be car being carried away. What were you saying, Ron? Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, not having a good enough foundation, literally, that we, we get knocked over, okay, and fall from our own steadfastness. Uh, what is the solution to the warning? Okay, grow in grace. Okay, that's the solution. All right, this is just introductory material here tonight, and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get more in-depth as we go, but 
just for the sake of tonight and the introduction, I want to give you a couple um, lists, I guess you could say. I want to look at the benefits of a study like this. I want to look at the requirements of a study like this. And I want to look at some cautions in a study like this. But first, the, the benefits. The benefits of, of, of this kind of a study. And, and I've got four of them for you. First of all, the benefits of, of a study like this is it places the teachings in a systematic order, okay? The teachings, the, the core doctrines that we're going to look at are, are, are doctrines, and we find them because we, we, we place them in, in kind of a, a systematic order here. I don't know how else to put it. It's impossible, really, for progress to be made by a, a researcher of, of the field, or really a researcher in any field of, of science, unless materials are organized. And that's what we're going to seek to do here with this study. Teachings will be placed in a systematic order so that we can see the whole of Scripture come together. All right? Which brings me to the second benefit. Conclusions will be drawn from the whole of Scripture. Um, when a student systematically singles out all of the passages on, on one given subject, weighs them carefully within the context that they fall, and observes the distinctions that might be there, we can come to very truthful and accurate conclusions. When we don't do that, it's very easy to come to false conclusions because we, we start looking at things um, in light of only one place in Scripture rather than every place that it happens in Scripture. Thirdly, uh, proper goals will be pursued. Uh, this is, I want you to know that this is not just about knowledge. It's not just about having information. I, I, I want this information to be in, in our hearts. Uh, this study is about helping us as God's children, grow in our relationship with him, okay, to, to, to know him better. If we understand better who God is, if we understand better what his purposes are, we're more likely to, to trust him, okay? So proper goals will be pursued, and then um, this study that we're looking at affects our view of everything. This study is going to affect our view of everything. What we're going to learn should do that. The doctrines of God should be what shapes our view of, of everything we know in, in the world. All right. So these are the, the benefits of this study, the requirements of this study, and I have four of them as well. Personal requirements of this study. Number one is the indwelling spirit and submission to him as a teacher. The indwelling spirit and submission to him as a teacher. Um, turn to John chapter 16. And let's look at verses 13 and 14. And there's Jesus speaking. And this is prior to the giving of the Holy Spirit to those who, who would believe in him. He says this in verse 13 and 14. He says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And basically what we find is, is the 
all of the teachings that we find in the epistles of the New Testament have their seed in something that Jesus spoke. And it's by the Holy Spirit that, that we learn them. So really, a requirement of this study to, to gain the absolute most out of it is the indwelling spirit and our submission to him as teacher. Secondly is, is faith. Faith is a requirement, okay? The Bible is not to be judged by our thinking. Um, we must accept the truth of God's word by faith. And, and I say that, but I want you to understand that it's not a blind faith. In fact, that, that's the purpose of this study, is show you that, that what, we, what we believe to be true, what we trust in, it has wheels under it. It has a foundation under it, okay? Um, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Okay, so it's not about us. It's about, it's about what we find right here. But faith is a requirement. Thirdly, an appetite and desire for truth. An appetite and desire for truth. Um, we actually talked about this a few Sundays ago in our series through Luke. Um, you know, if, if we don't want to understand something, we're going to be blinded to it. If we desire to understand it, okay, especially with the indwelling spirit and his teaching, it's going to be revealed to us. So an appetite and desire for truth is a requirement um, of, this, of this study. Um, in fact, in Luke 8.18, it says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear, and therefore take heed how you hear. So it's all about that appetite. If, if you want to know, we can know. Um, number four, uh, a requirement, personal requirement is a mind that understands the value of a system and organization. Okay, this is a mind that's not as satisfied with just bits and pieces taken here and here, but it's, it's taking all those bits and pieces and, and putting that, that puzzle together. In fact, 2 Timothy... Let's turn to this one. This is one that will be a, a, a focus next week as well, but 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in, in one of the personal requirements is in this study is a mind that takes all of Scripture and, and rightly divides it so that we can understand the whole of it. We can understand how all of these pieces of the puzzle fit together. A um, couple cautions. A couple cautions, two of them. Uh, the believer must keep a spirit of humility. Why would humility be important in this? Okay, you become vain in your own thinking if you don't. Christy? Okay, nobody will listen to you. Ron? Okay, all right. Yeah, we, 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 we decide what it means rather than it deciding what it means. Okay, and, and if we, and on top of that, how, how teachable is a prideful person? <laughs> Not very. I mean, it's, it's hard to teach somebody who thinks they already know it. 
And that is why a spirit of humility is important. So the caution is a believer must keep a spirit of humility. And, and I will tell you, the more you know about Scripture, the harder that becomes. Okay, it, it, it's a danger. It really is a danger. And I, I, I remember, and it's been, oh, it's been probably close to 15 years ago now that I preached on John 3.16 for the first time. And it was one of those where I really, I had to force myself to stop and, and re-study it out because John 3.16, I mean, who doesn't know John 3.16? Who doesn't know what that means, right? And that's the attitude that we want to avoid. That's the caution we need to take. When we come to even those really familiar passages, we need to stop and make sure that we have that spirit of humility ready to be taught, okay? Another caution is the spiritual life, or I should say our spiritual life, must be abreast with our knowledge. Um, it does us really no good to know things about God's word, but not have God's word penetrate and affect our heart and our life. So really a, a caution is, again, and I, I've mentioned this already, that it's not just about knowledge. That is not just about information so we can argue a point and win, all right? This is, the caution is the things that we learn here I hope will change us, will transform us. All right, so we've looked at the benefits of a study. Again, this is all introductory material, benefits of a study like this. We've looked at personal requirements of a study like this. We've looked at a couple cautions, a couple more things here. Sources our sources in this study, okay, are going to be limited to two things. Um, one of them, obviously, is this book that we have in our hands, the Bible. 66 inspired writings from God through man to us, all right? So that's one of our sources, the Word of God, the Bible, um, the other one, any guesses? Spirit of God? Of course, he's going to teach us from the Word of God. So another source. Prayer? That'd be, that, that's going to be the Word of God again, too, coming back to us. One more. It's a big one. Find it right in... What was that? <laughs> Webster's 1828, no, no, um, no, not me for sure. How, how can people that have never seen the word of God know that God exists? Creation, creation, it speaks volumes to us, and certainly... It is secondary as compared. In fact, I, I, I don't know. There may be a, a few things that creation can teach us that the Word of God doesn't. Um, one of them might be, and we can talk about this later if you want, but one of them might be awe and majesty. Okay, and I'm, that's two. <laughs> That's two, but they are, they are connected. And I know, I, I know exactly what you're thinking right now. But anyway, we won't, get, uh, we won't go there. Anyway, all right, yeah. I, I, I want to go there, but I'm not going to go there. Okay. <laughs> um, what were we talking about again? Bible and creation. 
awesome and majesty. They're, they're, they're similar though, right? They're, they're, they're similes, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm good. Creation, the word of God. Here are some false sources, and this is something that the world looks to quite a bit, but I want you to know that we're not going to be looking at these false sources of doctrine. Rationalism, that, Ron actually alluded to this one. An attitude that rejects all supernatural revelation and limits our knowledge of, of what we know of God but to the human mind, okay? Because I, I will tell you, there are things that we are going to learn through this series that are beyond what our human mind can comprehend. We, we, we can't wrap our mind and understand some of the things we're going to look at. So rationalism is definitely not a source of, of information, the study of doctrine. Uh, certainly mysticism will not play a part in this study of doctrine. And really, when I, when I talk about mysticism, I, I guess I'm even thinking of, of um, claimed revelation beyond what we find right here, okay? There are a lot of cults, um, the occult, and even world religions that call on um, mystical happenings that happen to a, a person that they claim to be a source of, of revelation concerning God. Um, so rationalism is not going to be a source. Mysticism is not going to be a source. Uh, the church and church creeds, and while there are a lot of good theologians out there that have, that have said and come to some really brilliant conclusions, while there are some great church creeds that, are, are, that express some very core doctrines, they are not a source of, they are not a source of doctrine. In fact, most creeds take what they're made up of from what is right here, okay? So, rationalism, mysticism, church and church creeds is not going to be a source of doctrine, and I'll, I'll even uh, go a little further, well, we'll, t we'll touch on that in a minute. Miracles. Miracles will not be a source of doctrine. Um, there are a lot of uh, teachings out there that um, come because of a claimed miracle, false teachings out there that are established because of some kind of false miracle that happened. But, but I want you to know that even, even the miracles of, the, uh, of Jesus and the apostles um, were designed to point people to, to this, okay? So miracles are not going to be a source of doctrine. Clergymen are not going to be a source in this study of doctrine. Um, there are many clergymen, uh, men of God, who claim to speak as uh, um, God's mouthpiece today and even a source of, of new revelation. Well, we're going to stick to this right here, what God has to say. Um, Who decided what doctrines of the church, or should, should, let me rephrase that. Who decided what the doctrines of the church would be and how did they come to that conclusion? Jeff? Okay, all right. And, and, and there's, again, false teachings that point back to various councils of the church and that sort of thing. But I want you to know that the doctrines of the church are teachings that were discovered from God's word. It wasn't a matter of, all right, I like this one, the church is going to adopt that one. I don't like that one, the church is not going to adopt that one. I want to close with four aspects. The doctrines, the teachings we're going to be looking at, in particular those core doctrines, I want, to, I want to give you four aspects of how those doctrines were discovered and then we're done here tonight. 
okay? Number one, the doctrines of the church were discovered because they are clear, repeated, and supported. In fact, I think I have a slide that gives you all of these. There it is, right there. This is how we've come to the conclusions that we're going to be teaching through this series. Doctrines of the Bible will be clear, repeated, and supported. Secondly, and I hope obviously, the most important doctrines will be the clearest, the most repeated, and the most supported. Um, the, uh, the doctrine of salvation. Any idea, all right, obviously it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Can you give me a guess as to how many times the New Testament alone talks about faith in Christ as the way to obtain salvation? 87. Good guess. About 150. About 150. And, and that tells us <laughs> that's important, right? And that's just the New Testament. That's just the New Testament. Um, doctrines must be formed by a... And I, 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 a true scientific systematic study of the Bible, where we're actually observing what it says, weighing our observations, and coming to a true conclusion. And I say true scientific because there's a lot of pop science and um, not science at all out there, okay? So doctrines must be formed by a, a scientific, systematic study of the Bible. And then um, doctrines are never built on obscure passages. There are things that the Bible teaches, sometimes even, even well, sometimes, oftentimes, even good things. And I want you to know that there are things that it teaches that are um, bad, too. It's just repeating evil, evil teachings, okay, so we know what they are. But um, doctrines, core and important doctrines, are never built on obscure passages. And that should really go without saying because of the, the three that um, preceded that. But I, I want you to know that what we're looking at here is many pieces of a, a very tightly knit work. Okay? Um, and then... Lastly, this morning, and I don't have this up there, but we're going to approach the study with only one presupposition. One presupposition, and that is the Bible is the Word of God. We have to approach, in fact, any, any science, any um, study that anybody does in any subject, it is, it's always approached with some presuppositions. We have to start someplace. And the one presupposition is that this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And, and, and that is where it has to begin. And, and I'll tell you that if it is false, it'll be exposed. It'll expose itself. Every other writing that purports to be the Word of God, that claims to be the Word of God, exposes itself as not being. All right? So... If we start with that presupposition, we start there with that presupposition because it claims to be. If the Bible never claimed to be the word of God, there'd be no reason to have this study at all. But it does claim to be, so we start with that presupposition, and it's either going to expose itself or support itself. And, and obviously, because of our study, you're going to find that it supports itself 100%. All right. And that is where we're going to end tonight. But we do have a few minutes, and I'm going to do my best through this whole series to try to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of each class just for discussion, questions, what have you. But anything like that tonight? Amanda.
Okay. Very good. And I think that, that we could actually connect that even to um, Well, yeah, I guess it wouldn't really connect to rationalism that well. So yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. Um, many people do base their beliefs on how they feel, period. And we're not going to do that here. So thank you for bringing that up. Richard. Sure, yeah. Sure, so it, it, is, it is a source in that regard. Yeah, very good. Other thoughts? Okay, well. What's that? Oh, the, the book we're doing for men's Bible study. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, let's close our time in prayer. Father, um, we do thank you for uh, these times we can come together. Uh, thank you for revealing yourself to us. And I, I do pray for this series, Lord. I, I pray that it will be some very um, important lessons through this, some very exciting lessons through this. But ideally, Lord, I pray that it grows us in our relationship with you. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.